You know what? It's that time of year. And I was telling my wife on the way down here, even though I don't think she really heard me or understood what I said, but it seems like the Bradford pears are just really showing themselves this year. The ones up home look like big giant snowballs on, the, on a tree stalk. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's beautiful. So it's that time of year, the, the Bradford pears, the daffodils, and, you know, the pollen. And the <laughs> pollen hasn't really gotten that bad yet, but I think we've all had some, some sinus issues throughout the year anymore, it seems like. But anyway, it's that, it's that time of year where it's, for me, and I'm assuming the same for you, hard to get your mind, at least church-wise, anywhere but that it's spring that it's a new beginning and along with that comes Passover the days of unleavened bread how do we get to this time of year and not that we not that we should not that not that members of this family and and of this understanding that we should have our minds much else now we do our minds do wonder don't get me wrong I'm not sitting gonna stand here and say that that's all I think about all day every day is that it's spring and it's Passover but there's, I don't think there's probably a day passes for any of us that we don't think about that and realize, man, another year. And as I'd stated earlier, I hope more of us will be here this year because last year, um, I know Chris and a few of you were here. We had the cameras going, um, and the rest of us were tuning in via the, the stream and, and doing Passover that way. So hopefully this year um, we can, more of us can be together again so it's hard not to not to get our minds there but I'll, I'll I won't double dip too much um, since Friday night we'll be here before we know it it's gonna be a busy week it's gonna be a busy weekend coming up but so I won't I won't just do a Passover service I guess now as far as the scriptures and stuff but it's hard not to have your mind there but, it, but since Friday night, it will be here, um, and, and this coming weekend, several of us will be together. Hopefully, the Virginia group will get to come down, or, or several of them. Hopefully, God willing, we'll all be here. Um, together with whom? I mean, besides it just being, you know, two, two church groups being together, I mean, it's, why is that special? When we think about a weekend coming up, and it just so happens, as I already stated several times, this, this year it just happens to be Passover on Friday, a regular Sabbath, and then the first day of unleavened bread on Sunday. So there's really three days in a row there. Gives us an opportunity to spend some time together. And why is that special? Well, you've already said it. It's special because it's spring. It's spring, and it's Passover. Why is it special? God's Word says, For we were all baptized by one spirit for we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body whether Jews or Gentiles slave or free and we were all given the one spirit to drink 1 Corinthians 12 13 if you want to jot that down for we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit, the one spirit to drink. I have a couple of visual aids here, and I don't know if this will work out on camera. And this is not the first time I've kept these, and I will keep them. And you, if you, you probably remember these, but from where you're sitting, and this is two hardback books from Life magazine that they put out 2001 probably or 2002 and from where you're sitting it looks like the American flag and the Statue of Liberty which it is that is the images that you see that's not a but if you were to look at these really close this is scenes from around America it's tiny individual pictures and it makes up and I've often marveled at how they do that, how they can arrange pictures in a way to make them form an image. And I've seen people do it with push pins. I've seen people do it with all kinds of different things where they can put an image together by putting all these little images together. This one was my favorite because it says one nation and the pictures, the individual pictures are the people that succumbed to the tragedy of 9-11. 
And there's all kinds of faces and there's all kinds of stories, there's all kinds of lives represented here. But it makes this image of the American flag and it says one nation. And this of course is a Statue of Liberty and again made up of hundreds if not thousands of individual pictures. And yes, I've used these before. I've used these in messages and I will keep them and I'm not going to say that I'll never use them again. But I use them to make a point. So as to form one body. That scripture in 1 Corinthians 12. Baptized of one spirit. Why? So as to form one body. You know, we, we come into this thing. We go through the process. We, we, we get ourselves. We don't get ourselves. God in his calling gets us to the point of baptism. And we join a body, right? Not that we have to be baptized to participate and be a part of that body. But we are all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. Now, for me, brethren, that is the whole purpose of this endeavor. For me, as an individual. And I will go further and say, to me, that's the whole purpose of this endeavor as what you see here. And what you will see next weekend is there's hopefully more of us in these seats. The purpose of this whole endeavor is to form that one body. Or else, maybe we can dismiss God's word and say, well, that's not what it says. That's not what it means. I don't, it, it, maybe it is what it says. Maybe it is what it means. I'm just not a partaker. I don't believe it. But to me, and I think to you, that is the whole purpose of this endeavor. 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 Easy for me to say. For you as an individual, which could be one of those tiny pictures, or a pixel, if you will. One pixel in that picture. And collectively as a group, to make up what? So as to form one body, and what body would you think that is? The body of Christ. Is that not what scripture teaches us to understand? That we are all members of one body, and that body is Christ? And members of the church, yes. The church being the body of Christ as well. Because what the body of Christ is, is the whole community, the whole community of believers and partakers. You've heard me say it many times, to, or, or restate the phrase, there's two kinds of people. Christ died for all of us. Christ died for every person, and there's those that accept it and those who don't. And hopefully out of those who don't, a lot of those will. And, and as, as we get into later times, obviously more people will. The body of Christ is the whole community of believers and partakers. You know, an 8 megapixel camera, <clears throat> an 8 megapixel, megapixel camera, which is small by today's standards, even some, a lot of your phones have larger cameras than that, but an 8 megapixel camera puts 8 million pixels, 8 million pixels or tiny squares of information per inch. It's hard, it's hard to believe, isn't it? How do you get 8 million of anything in an inch, in a square inch of space? But that's what megapixel means. It means if it's 8 megapixel, it's 8 million tiny squares of information per inch. 12 megapixel, 12 million tiny squares of information per inch. Now what that boils down to is it determines how much you can blow something up, and I don't, I don't like that term, how much you can enlarge something, how much you can zoom in without losing integrity and without the picture becoming distorted or you know you lose resolution. Because the more information you have per inch, the more you can zoom in and not lose the integrity or lose the resolution of the picture. So I think for us, one of the reasons that's special, that we'll have hopefully more people here next Sabbath and next Sunday, is that it's more information per square inch, isn't it? We'll have a few more megapixels next week. Which tells us what? Is it not a, a better defined picture of the body of Christ? If we could have all believers 
together in one place. If we could have all believers and partakers together in one place, which is God's goal, right? Eventually, to form that completed picture. But for our purposes today, brethren, we, talk, we hear Scripture talk about no one lights their lamp and hides it under a bucket or puts it under something where it can't be seen, right? You become a pixel in the image of Christ. If you are a believer and partaker, you are a pixel. You are that tiny square of information. You are that tiny square of light that makes that picture. Just like what I just showed you with those book covers, those book jackets. From where you sit, you saw the Statue of Liberty and a piece of the American flag. You come up here and look at it, and you see all those tiny images. But they made up that big picture, didn't they? That's what we are. It takes every pixel in this room to make up Crossroads Church of God seventh day. And if you're not here, then we, sometimes we can't be here. Katrina and I weren't here last week. Chris and Kane aren't here this week. So, you know, and they're, and they're missed. I don't know if we were missed or not. I hope we were. We did get the tune in. But I want us to think about ourselves that way because we, we're not unimportant. We may be out here by ourselves when we're just that tiny little square of information, that tiny little square of light, but when we come together, boy, ain't it something? Or couldn't it really be something? To make up, we are all baptized of one spirit. So as to form one body. So as to form one body. The more of us there are together, the more the body that we can see. Or that should be the case. It is a special occasion. It is a special occasion. Because it's the one time a year when we get to, I guess we could do it m more. I don't know that it's, it's called for us to do that. I do know that, that taking of the bread and wine and the foot washing and all that is, is important enough that it's one of the holy days that it gives you a makeup date for. That if something happens and you can't keep it, then 30 days later on the next full moon, observe it. That's how important it is. If you can't be there, and I've had to do it. My wife was in labor on one <laughs> Passover service, and for some reason she didn't want me to go to a Passover service. So 30 days later, just her and I, intimate little setting, Katrina and I have done the same thing. Not 30 days later, but we have, well, last year, you know, we tuned in, but we were there. Just her and I doing the Passover service. But it is special because life is blooming again. It's been a long year. And it's been kind of a long winter. <laughs> and maybe we're not done with winter completely, but when you see azaleas and daffodils and Bradford pears, it's a little bit more, another couple of weeks for the dogwoods. But life is blooming. And what better time then when things are renewing and things are turning green again and the birds are singing a little louder and the, and the bees are starting to fly and, and so forth, what better time to renew our fellowship with God, which was hopefully what we will do here. That's the goal, is to renew our fellowship, renewing of the vows, whatever it is, being washed, being clean. Once again, life is blooming. You know, we take stock, and we'll do that this week. We'll think about it. Where am I? What am I doing? Where am I weak? Where am I strong? Hopefully we do that, and we probably won't do, a, probably won't do enough of it. I don't know that we could ever do enough, but hopefully we take that time. And not only that, but after we go through Passover and we go through the, you know, the Sabbath service and the first day of unleavened bread, even during those days, it's even a better opportunity because we're being mindful of what we put in our put in our mouth, what we take into our bodies, and not only what we take in, but what we leave out, right? So it gives us that, that seven days to think about that renewal. So we do take stock, and we take the symbols, and we humble ourselves in service to one another. It's hard to do. It's not hard to be in service. It's hard to 
be serviced. Imagine our Savior, you know, also knowing the, the time of year. He's in the final week of his earthly ministry, in the flesh, anyway. Because he knew. He knew life was blooming again, and he knew what was coming. And that's why at the very end of that, he began to be seriously heavy. And with a lot of pain and a lot of emotion. And a lot of prayer. Twice that week, he cleansed the temple. But he knew. You've heard me say, and I remember at the feast, and you talk about the sand sliding through the hourglass. Well, he knew. And not, not that his time was up and not that he didn't have lots and lots of and a major part of his work to do yet even after what was coming but he knew that it was his final week in the flesh and imagine how he wanted to prepare his taught ones I've got a week and he sees he sees where they are and who they are and how they're reacting to what he's already... You know, we can read it in Scripture, but, but even the Scriptures tell us that if, it, if everything that he taught and everything that he preached was written, this room wouldn't hold it. The world couldn't contain it, it says. So we don't know what all that teaching was. We know what we have recorded for us, and even with that, you know, we look at those guys and think, and ladies, and think... So what are you, just trying to, I can't, because his thoughts are way higher than anything I can imagine. But just to ponder for a minute how he wanted to prepare them for his departure. And that's put very mildly. It was, it was, a, it was a very painful departure. They were going to see some stuff, very difficult, very emotional disorienting. People who had been with him for three and a half years almost day and night and it was going to be disorienting for them. Very difficult to watch. Very difficult to process. We have, we have difficulty brethren in our day to day processing information. Sometimes we just go through things, we see things, we hear, experience things and we, we have to it's a popular phrase, get our heads around it. Not only how do I handle it, but what does it mean for me? What do these things mean? These things are happening. There's been this series of things happening, and I'm, I think God's trying to show me something, or it's, it's meant for something. I've got I've to figure it out. I've got to know. I can't imagine being one of his disciples and trying to make sense and to understand what I'm seeing, what I'm feeling. You know? Like I say, we can look back at these people, we can discuss and describe and whatever we want to do and say, man, their minds weren't perceiving it. They just, they weren't getting it. Let's not think that you and I would have been any different in their sandals. You know, we, we get a little, we won't call it self-righteous, but we do think sometimes, if I'd have been there, I think I could have. But in reality, we know. I don't think we would have probably been much different in their shoes. Because we're looking at it from 2021. <laughs> We've got a lot of information they didn't have. They were with him. They had a lot of information we don't have, most likely. But think about it. This hope, this elation, here he is. Here's the Messiah. Well, he's going set to things, set things straight. And then he's gone. This is not what I anticipated going on? Have I been wrong? I don't know that we would be any different because we do it today. As I've already said, we, we get bewildered, we get overwhelmed, we're sorting things out, maybe get a little wobbly at times. I don't know if I can handle this. And we try to take strength from the scripture that, we, that says he will not put more on us than we can bear. And I happen to think that means that he will not put more on us than we can bear alone or with him pardon me, we can bear a lot more with him than we can alone. 
Because sometimes I think we do experience more than we could bear alone. But he will not put more on us than we can bear if we'll trust him and lean on him, right? We do. We do those things. We get overwhelmed, maybe a little wobbly. You know, Scripture in a few places talks about the cares of the world choking the word. And I think the, the sower parable in Matthew 13 probably is the clearest place where it talks about, and he that received seed on the whichever ground it was, stony ground or whatever, did okay, and then once persecution, once hard times came, and the cares of the world choking the word. Now we're not, that's not us, is it? We never get to that point. The word's never choked in us. <laughs> well, I can't speak for you. And it's usually my own doing. If I get bewildered, disoriented, or whatever it is, I know those are strong words. And I think most of us here are mature enough that we don't, we don't dwell there. We don't stay there very long. We put things in perspective and we, we put one foot in front of the other and we move along. But the cares of the world choking the word. Cares of the world. Cares of the world. Do we still have those? But they're not distracting, surely. I want to, I want to step into an intimate moment for a little bit here. And this is, I'm, you know me. I, I'll tell myself that I'm gonna, I'm gonna get through that. I'm gonna, if I have to run through it. I'm gonna get through it. It's not gonna stir me up and make me, you know. But I don't, I don't know, and I don't. If I'm being honest, I don't really care. But. I want to step into an intimate moment for a little bit. Common, common for the time of year. And it will be spoken of most likely again over the next week or two. No. No, said Peter. You will never wash my feet no John 13 8 <clears throat> no said Peter you shall never wash my feet Just you, just you and Jesus, okay? It's hard to imagine that you're sitting somewhere, anywhere. And you have God. Looking into your eyes, which is the window to your soul. It's just you and him. Now I say it's the window to your soul, brethren, and you <laughs> you can't put stuff away. You've got God in the flesh standing in front of you, looking into your soul. And don't think, and you know that he can, any time, any day. You can't put, <laughs> you can't clean house, you can't put stuff away. It's you and God in the flesh. I say we wouldn't be any different in their sandals, and I don't know that we'd be any different out of their sandals. You will never, Lord. You can't put stuff away. There's no running. There's no hiding. There's no joking it off. You can't use smoking mirrors and, oh, this isn't happening. Let me, let me distract him.
Where have you stepped this year, my brethren? It's been a, it's been a crazy year. We don't need to rehash that. It's, it's been a long year. In some ways, and it seems like, man, here we are. It's Passover season again. Thank you. Thank you. But where have you stepped this year? Well, I can't answer that for you, and I'm not sure I want to answer it for me. And I'm certainly not going to do it today, not to you. Again, God looks into my soul. There's no house cleaning. There's no, I'll put this over here, you won't see this. That's raw, isn't it? God in the flesh. I don't know how I would have reacted, to be honest with you. I can't put myself, but I can't, I can't fault Peter because, I, yeah. Where have you stepped? And I said I couldn't speak for you, but I can almost assure that it's not always on the narrow path. The narrow path is not where every footprint you've left this year. You've left some footprints in other places. And we could stand here all day and talk about what is that narrow path? What do you mean, preacher, when you say narrow path? Well, I've got my own idea about what that narrow path is. But I can almost guarantee you that of the people in this room, there's some footprints all over the place. And hopefully some of those footprints are on that, <laughs> on that narrow path because I think we do, we do get there. And I, and I, I know I, that sounds like, I'm, and I am in some ways, repeating things that I say commonly when I'm up here that we are talking about getting off into the weeds and we wander and we do this and that. But, you know, it's always true. Not always on the narrow path, perhaps infrequently, if we're being honest. Now, and I hope this is not a problem for you. And I wish I could say with confidence it's not a problem for me. But maybe it's enough to have the path in sight. Right? There it is. I'm not always on it. In fact, for the last year, I don't see many of my shoe prints. But I see the path. It's right there. As long as I can see it. I'm okay. Pass right there. Maybe it's enough to have the path in sight while we get caught up in the cares of the world, right? I can still see the path. And while we work through all of this, While we work through all this, he's standing right there. Basin, and towel, standing right where we left him. If you won't let me wash you. If you won't, let me wash you. You have no part. Always there. Why? Because he knows, brethren. He knows that you're a part of the image. He knows that you're part of the image. Print that in your mind. Jesus Christ knows that you are part of his image. And that's why he doesn't go anywhere. Again, he asked them, who is it that you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these go. That's what he's always done. It's what he's always done and what he's always going to continue to do. If it's me you're looking for, here I am, let these go. I stand in the gap. 
I stand in their stead. Was he in your place hanging on the tree? Absolutely. It's our sin. It's our sin, not his. If you are looking for me, then let these go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of these that you have given me. John 18, 7 and 9. That's from his prayer, by the way, in 17, verse 12. Or that part of his prayer. The words that would be fulfilled that he had spoken. I have not lost one of these you gave me. He knows where you've been. He knows where I've been. He knows where I've been, yet here he stands. Or stoops. I don't want to say kneel because... No, not kneeling. <clears throat> it's difficult. It's difficult. And to me, it's part of the dark glass. Because we use that scripture most often to say that we, we understand this much. But one day we're going to understand so much more. But I think... Part of that dark glass, <clears throat> part of that dark glass that we look through, brethren, is when we stand ourselves in front of a mirror. And we don't like what we see. And even worse than that, even worse than that is what we think of ourselves. Because you know what that is? You know what that thing is? That when you that image. When you think of yourself, oh, these are all the places I'm. I wish I could do something. I wish I could fix this. I don't like this about myself. We've heard it. We all go through it. We've heard, we hear Paul talk about it. To me, brethren, that's part of the dark glass as well. Because what we see in the mirror, maybe we don't like from a physical standpoint. You know, I wish I looked more like the Wolverine. <laughs> well, maybe not with the pointed hair and the claws, but you know what I mean. Maybe we don't like what we see physically, mentally, emotionally. It's a dark glass. And what we think of ourselves is a dark glass as well. Because brethren, that's not what he sees. We see ourselves in a mirror and we see ourselves by what we think of ourselves and believe it or not, what we think of ourselves distorts what we see in the mirror. Our image looking back from us in a mirror is distorted because of what we think of ourselves. There's diseases where people can look like this microphone stand here and see it's a sickness it's sad I don't we're not to that extreme hopefully but well you can look at me and tell me I'm you know I'm, I don't look like that microphone stand but it does distort what you see what you think of yourselves I hope I hope this holy day season can help us I hope this Holy Day season, brethren, can help us for a minute glimpse ourselves through his eyes. It's hard. But if what I think of myself was accurate, it's hard for me to imagine him still be standing there with the towel and basin ready to wash. And he does. He does, and he will do it again. Because he says, what you've done unto the least of my brethren, you've done unto me. I hope that we can glimpse ourselves through his eyes. 
because he didn't give himself for, for what you think of yourself or what you see or think you see in the mirror. It's those thoughts that put us in Peter's chair. You'll never. But he did. <laughs> he did. You know, Scripture, we, we can go way back here. On the creation. And we get to, to a point to where it says, let us make mankind, let us make womankind in our image and in our likeness. Now that, we can take that as individuals. You know, I've always took that to mean I'm, I'm in the image of God. He has two ears, two eyes, a mouth, nose, legs, feet, hands, whatever. And I'm, I still believe that. But let's make, let's make them in our image and in our likeness. <laughs> let's put a picture together. Let's make our image and our likeness. Each, each one of those is that little square of information, that little, little bit of light. Nobody lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel. You let it burn. Let us make them in our image. Jew, Gentile, slave, or free. All of us. All of us. If you're in the community of believers and partakers, it means you. And we were all given the same spirit. One spirit. To drink. To drink. Life blooms, brethren. You can look outside, you can drive down the road, and you can see it. Life is blooming. The earth is greening up again. The earth declares his glory. But so do you. So do you. You declare God's glory. In his image. In his likeness. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. The pledge of a clear conscience toward God. What did I say? You can't put things away. You can't sweep up and clean up and hide or run. <laughs> this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 3.21. It saves you. Saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which we all look forward to sharing that experience. You know, back in my day, Way back in my day, Huey Lewis in the news said that it was hip to be square. It's hip to be square. <laughs> kind of a catchy little tune. And you might find yourself, if you know the song, you may be humming it on the way home, or sometimes at night you'll be, it's hip to be square. Not that all of you do. Probably all of you weren't Huey Lewis fans, but I'm a tiny square of information, a pixel. That's my job. That's my job. In the picture that is Jesus Christ, in the picture that is the image of Christ, I'm, I'm a little square of information. I'm a little square of light that makes up the image, the likeness. Think it's small? Well, let one pixel die. Let one pixel, look at something where one pixel has fizzled. You'll see it. It draws your eye to it. It's like a, you know what, in a punch bowl. But it, you, let, you think it's not, it's not small. So baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. It's a lovely time of year, brethren. The more we are together, the happier we'll be. <laughs> the more we get together. But the more we are together, the sharper the image. 
All I can say, brethren, is come, let us drink together. Because he tells us those that drink this water will never thirst. <laughs>